Section 51 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty four Henry the Third and the Religious Wars, fifteen seventy four to fifteen eighty nine, part six. On the eighteenth of December, fifteen eighty eight, during an entertainment given by Catherine de Medici on the marriage of her niece, Christine de Lorraine, with Ferdinand de Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, Henry the Third summoned to his cabinet three of his most intimate and safest confidants, Marshal Daumont, nicolas d'angennes lord of rambouillet and sieur de beauvais nangy after having laid before them all the duke of guise's intrigues against him and the perils of the position in which they placed him quote, what ought i to do he said help me to save myself by some speedy means End quote. they asked the king to give them twenty-four hours to answer in Next day, the 19th, Sieur de Maintenon, brother of Rambouillet, and Alfonso Corso d'Ornano were added to the party. Only one of them was of opinion that the Duke of Guise should at once be arrested and put upon his trial. The four others were for a shorter and a surer process, that of putting the Duke to death by a sudden blow. He is evidently making war upon the King, they said, and the King has a right to defend himself henry the third who had his mind made up asked crillon commandant of the regiment of guards quote, think you that the duke of guise deserves death end quote. Quote, yes sir end quote. Quote, very well then i choose you to give it to him end quote. Quote, i am ready to challenge him end quote. Quote, that is not what is wanted as leader of the league he is guilty of high treason end quote. Quote, very well, sir, then let him be tried and executed. End quote. Quote, but Crillon, nothing is less certain than his conviction in a court of law. He must be struck down unexpectedly. End quote. Quote, sir, I am a soldier, not an assassin. End quote. The king did not persist, but merely charged Crillon, who promised to keep the proposal secret. At this very time, Guise was requesting the king to give him a constable's grand provost and archers to form his guard in his quality of lieutenant general of the kingdom. The king deferred his reply. Catherine de Medici supported the Lorrainer prince's request. Quote, in two or three days it shall be settled, said Henry. He had ordered twelve poniards from an armorer's in the city. On the twenty first of December, he told his project to Loignac an officer of his guards who was less scrupulous than crillon and undertook to strike the blow in concert with the forty-five trusty guards at the council on the twenty-second of december the king announced his intention of passing christmas in retreat at notre dame de clery and he warned the members of the council that next day the session would take place very early in order to dispose of business before his departure on the evening of the twenty second the duke of guise on sitting down at table found under his napkin a note to this effect quote, the king means to kill you End quote. guise asked for a pen wrote at the bottom of the note quote, he dare not End quote, and threw it under the table next day december twenty third henry the third rising at four a m after a night of great agitation admitted into his cabinet by a secret staircase the nine guards he had chosen handed them the poniards he had ordered placed them at the post where they were to wait for the meeting of the council and bade charles d'entraigues to go and request one of the royal chaplains quote, to say mass that god might give the king grace to be able to carry out an enterprise which he hoped would come to an issue within an hour and on which the safety of france depended end quote. then the king retired into his closet the members of the council arrived in succession it is said that one of the archers on duty when he saw the duke of guise mounting the staircase trod on his foot as if to give him warning but if he observed it guise made no account of it any more than of all the other hints he had already received before entering the council chamber he stopped at a small oratory connected with the chapel said his prayer and as he passed the door of the queen mother's apartments signified his desire to pay his respects and have a few words with her catherine was indisposed and could not receive him some vexation it is said appeared in guise's face but he said not a word 
On entering the council chamber he felt cold, asked to have some fire lighted, and gave orders to his secretary, Pericard, the only attendant admitted with him, to go and fetch the silver gilt shell he was in the habit of carrying about him with damsons or other preserves to eat of a morning. Pericard was some time gone. Guise was in a hurry, and, quote, be kind enough, he said to M. de Morfontaine, to send word to M. de saint Prix, first groom of the chamber to Henry the Third, that I beg him to let me have a few damsons or a little preserve of roses or some trifle of the king's, end quote. Four brignol plums were brought him, and he ate one. His uneasiness continued. The eye close to his scar became moist. According to M. de Thou, he bled at the nose. He felt in his pocket for a handkerchief to use, but could not find one. Quote, my people, said he, have not given me my necessaries this morning. There is great excuse for them. They were too much hurried. End quote. At his request, Saint Prix had a handkerchief brought to him. Pericard passed his bonbon box to him, as the guards would not let him enter again. The duke took a few plums from it, threw the rest on the table, saying, quote, "'Gentlemen, who will have any?' and rose up hurriedly upon seeing the secretary of state Revol, who came in and said to him, quote, "'Sir, the king wants you. He is in his old cabinet.'" As soon as he knew that the Duke of Guise had arrived, and whilst these little incidents were occurring in the council chamber, Henry the Third had in fact given orders to his secretary Revol to go on his behalf and summon the duke but nambu usher to the council faithful to his instructions had refused to let anybody even the king's secretary enter the hall revol of a timid disposition and impressed it is said with the sinister importance of his commission returned to the cabinet with a very troubled air the king in his turn was troubled fearing lest his project had been discovered Quote, what is the matter revol said he what is it how pale you are you will spoil all rub your cheeks rub your cheeks End quote. Quote, there is nothing wrong, sir, only M. de Nambu would not let me in without Your Majesty's express command. End quote. Revol entered the council chamber and discharged his commission. The Duke of Guise pulled up his cloak as if to wrap himself well in it, took his hat, gloves, and his sweetmeat box, and went out of the room, saying, quote, Adieu, gentlemen, with a gravity free from any appearance of mistrust he crossed the king's chamber contiguous to the council hall courteously saluted as he passed loignac and his comrades whom he found drawn up and whom returning him a frigid obeisance followed him as if to show him respect on arriving at the door of the old cabinet and just as he leaned down to raise the tapestry that covered it guise was struck five poniard blows in the chest neck and reins Quote, God have mercy, he cried, and though his sword was entangled in his cloak, and he was himself pinned by the arms and legs, and choked by the blood that spurted from his throat, he dragged his murderers by a supreme effort of energy to the other end of the room, where he fell down backwards and lifeless before the bed of Henry the Third, who, coming to the door of his room and asking, quote, if it was done, end quote, contemplated with mingled satisfaction and terror the inanimate body of his mighty rival. Quote, who seemed to be merely sleeping, so little was he changed. End quote. Quote, My God, how tall he is! cried the king. He looks even taller than when he was alive. End quote. Quote, they are killing my brother! cried the cardinal of Guise when he heard the noise that was being made in the next room, and he rose up to run thither. The archbishop of Lyon, Peter d'Espignac, did the same. The Duke of Aumont held them both back, saying, quote, Gentlemen, we must wait for the king's orders. End quote. Orders came to arrest them both and confine them in a small room over the council chamber. They had quote, eggs, bread, wine from the king's cellar, their breviaries, their nightgowns, a palliasse, and a mattress end quote, brought to them there, and they were kept under ocular supervision for four and twenty hours the cardinal of guise was released the next morning but only to be put to death like his brother the king spared the archbishop of lyons quote, i am sole king said henry the third to his ministers as he entered the council chamber and shortly afterwards going to see the queen mother who was ill of the gout quote, how do you feel he asked quote, better she answered quote, so do i replied the king i feel much better this morning i have become king of france again the king of paris is dead End quote. Quote, you have had the duke of guise killed asked catherine have you reflected well god grant that you become not king of nothing at all i hope the cutting is right now for the sewing End quote. 
according to the majority of the historians catherine had neither been in the secret nor had anything to do with the preparations for the measure granted that she took no active part in it and that she avoided even the appearance of having any previous knowledge of it she was not fond of responsibility and she liked better to negotiate between the different parties than to make her decisive choice between them prudent tendencies grow with years and in fifteen eighty eight she was sixty-nine it is difficult however to believe that being the habitual confidant of her favourite son she was ignorant of a design long meditated and known to many persons many days before its execution the event once accomplished ill as she was and contrary to the advice of her physicians she had herself carried to the cardinal of bourbons who was still under arrest by the king's orders to promise him speedy release Quote, ah madame said the cardinal as he saw her enter these are some of your tricks you are death to us all however it may be thirteen days after the murder of the duke of guise on the fifth of january fifteen eighty nine catherine de medici herself died nor was her death so far as affairs and the public were concerned an event her ability was of the sort which is worn out by the frequent use made of it and which when old age comes on leaves no long or grateful reminiscence time has restored catherine de medici to her proper place in history she was quickly forgotten by her contemporaries she had good reason to say to her son as her last advice quote, now for the sewing it was not long before henry the third perceived that to be king it was not sufficient to have murdered his rival he survived the duke of guise only seven months and during that short period he was not really king all by himself for a single day never had his kingship been so embarrassed and impotent the violent death of the duke of guise had exasperated much more than enfeebled the league the feeling against his murderer was passionate and contagious the catholic cause had lost its great leader it found and accepted another in his brother the duke of mayenne far inferior to his elder brother in political talent and prompt energy of character but a brave and determined soldier a much better man of party and action than the sceptical undecided and indolent henry the third the majority of the great towns of france paris rouen orleans toulouse lyon amiens and whole provinces declared eagerly against the royal murderer he demanded support from the states-general who refused it and he was obliged to dismiss them the parliament of paris dismembered on the sixteenth of january fifteen eighty nine by the council of sixteen became the instrument of the leaguers the majority of the other parliaments followed the example set by that of paris the sorbonne consulted by a petition presented in the name of all catholics decided that frenchmen were released from their oath of allegiance to henry the third and might with a good conscience turn their arms against him henry made some obscure attempts to come to an arrangement with certain chiefs of the leaguers but they were rejected with violence the duke of mayenne having come to paris on the fifteenth of february was solemnly received at notre dame amidst shouts of hurrah for the catholic princes hurrah for the house of lorraine he was declared lieutenant-general of the crown and state of france he organized a council-general of the league composed of forty members and charged with the duty of providing for all matters of war the finance and the police of the realm pending a fresh convocation of states-general to counterbalance in some degree the popular element mayenne introduced into it fourteen personages of his own choice and a certain number of magistrates and bishops the delegates of the united towns were to have seats at the council whenever they happened to be at paris Quote, never says m henri very truly could the league have supposed itself to be so near becoming a government of confederated municipalities under the directorate of paris End quote there was clearly for henry the third but one possible ally who had a chance of doing effectual service and that was henry of navarre and the protestants it cost henry the third a great deal to have recourse to that party his conscience and his pusillanimity both revolted at it equally in spite of his moral corruption he was a sincere catholic and the prospect of excommunication troubled him deeply catholicism besides was in a large majority in france how then was he to treat with its foes without embroiling himself utterly with it meanwhile the case was urgent 
Henry was apprised by one of his confidants, Nicolas de Rambouillet, that one of the King of Navarre's confidants, Sully, who was then only Sieur de Rosny, was passing by Blois on his way to his master. He saw him and expressed to him his, quote, desire for a reconciliation with the King of Navarre and to employ him on confidential service, end quote the difficulty was to secure to the protestant king and his army then engaged in the siege of chatellerault a passage across the loire rosny undertook henry the third's commission he at the same time received another from sieur de brigueux governor of the little town of beaugency who said to him quote, i see well sir that the king is going the right way to ruin himself by timidity irresolution and bad advice and that necessity will throw us into the hands of the league for my part i will never belong to it and i would rather serve the king of navarre tell him that i hold at beaugency a passage over the loire and that if he will be pleased to send to me you or m de rebours i will admit into the town him who he sends to me upon receiving these overtures the king of navarre thought a while scratching his head then he said to rosny quote, do you think that the king has good intentions towards me and means to treat with me in good faith End quote. Quote, yes sir for the present and you need have no doubt about it for his straits constrain him thereto having nothing to look to in his perils but your assistance End quote. he had some dinner brought into his own cabinet for rosny and then made him post off at once on arriving in the evening at tours whither henry the third had fallen back rosny was taken to him about midnight at the top of the castle the king sent him off that very night he consented to everything that the king of navarre proposed promised him a town on the loire and said he was ready to make with him not a downright peace just at first but quote, a good long truce which in their two hearts would at once be an eternal peace and a sincere reconciliation End quote. when rosny got back to chatellerault quote, there was nothing but rejoicing everybody ran to meet him he was called quote, god rosny end quote, and one of his friends said to the rest quote, do you see yon man by god we shall all worship him and he alone will restore france i said so six years ago and villandry was of my opinion end, quote. end of section fifty one